I don't even know if this is okay to post here, but after two years, I finally feel like I can talk about it. This is a bit of a wild one, but unfortunately 100% true. In 2018, I ended up in a small town that didn't have very much in it and was pretty separated from everything with a friend I hadn't seen in about 11 years. I was staying at this friend's parents' house with a friend while I was there, which was fine of course. Well, until it wasn't. I woke up in the morning and friend had gone to work, leaving me with my parents for the day. I sat with them and talked for a while before they offered me some water. I accepted and they poured it from a jug because city water is so bad for you, so I get well water from my sister. All was good but I found the water a bit odd, but I'm from the big city and I'm not really exposed to well water so I assumed it was the difference. I should mention that I spend my time watching people and their body language, micro expressions, etc. in conversation because I find it interesting and over time I noticed a bit of a shift. Parents started saying things like, the world is a cruel place for beautiful people like you, but we won't ever be, and talking about how they'll always be there for me, how they'll keep me safe how they hope I spend a lot of time there, even though I live 8 hours away. I also realized that these statements were lining up when I was taking sips of water. I told myself I was being paranoid and my parents were insisting I drink the water while talking because they were being a parent, fretting over health and stuff. That's why they wanted me to drink the water from the well, you know. I did get a weird feeling from what I assumed was anxiety about a new place so when parent was gone to do something I poured it out, got a new glass, refilled it with tap water and sat back in my spot. This water was used for everything throughout the day. Coffee? Well water. Cooking? Steaming? Food cooked for me? Well water. The conversation kept bouncing back to those statements while I ate and such but again, just nerves. Later in the evening parents started talking about other things, like how the government wanted their secrets because they found a way to cure terminal illnesses, which I honestly don't have an issue with, sometimes people think things that aren't common. And then it abruptly switched to how their ex-partner stole their other two children by using chemical hypnosis to poison them against their parents. Okay. This was getting strange so I contacted my parents and asked if they'd switch my travel ticket to ASAP because my bad feeling was getting worse. I left my phone unattended while I washed my hair, and then friend came home. I felt better afterwards and sat in the kitchen with them feeling kind of ridiculous for being nervous about well water and uncommon ideas until parent filled friend's water bottle with tap water. That was it for me, I said I was tired and locked myself in the bedroom until the morning when I walked into the kitchen and told them I was leaving in three hours because of a family emergency. I was paranoid for days. I actually have witnesses to the fact that every time I talked about it my phone would ring with a hashtag from the area code. The first time was a coincidence, the next three weren't. I also got a text from a number I've never seen that said, Hey, Apathy, do you have time to chat? I asked who it was and they immediately said they had the wrong number, except my name isn't common and the spelling is even less so. I handed my company the phone and they told me I needed to talk to someone about what was happening because this wasn't normal and crossing into serious worry territory. I saw my psychologist a few days later and her exact words were, did you get a blood test when you got back? You should have gotten a blood test. She told me the behavior lines up with drugging someone. I was to monitor my mental health for worsening paranoia and or psychosis and to go to a hospital if anything out of the ordinary happened because it was way too late for any info to come up in a test. I had tech people run diagnostics on my phone and there were two programs I definitely never downloaded, like actually downloaded into a file that doesn't show up normally. I don't know how to explain it properly, so we fully factory reset my device and I changed my number. This is even more unsettling because I run virus scans on my devices unnecessarily often and nothing came up before they did some digging. I haven't heard from friends since and I haven't reached out. I'm healthy and sober with my mental health under control, but this still makes me so nervous to talk about. This is actually the first time I've ever talked about it openly on the internet, and I'm definitely nervous something will happen. But I've moved twice and changed all of my accounts, gotten a new phone, and changed my codes and passwords every three weeks. When I was seven I lived in a dusty, vacant part of the West with an atmosphere straight out of a Judy Bloom novel. Despite everyone in my neighborhood living on large, isolated plots of land, mostly ranching families, kids played hockey in the streets, crime was minimal to non-existent, and everybody knew everybody else. I had a tight-knit group of friends, names changed to protect privacy, let's call them Shirley, Natalie, and Bailey. We'd been friends since before we could walk, mostly because we were the same age and all lived in the same neighborhood. We weren't idiots, but we were definitely sheltered. 
The same could be said of our parents, many of whom ended their education after high school or even a bit sooner, and grew up in a similar, if not the exact same, community, where anyone who'd shake your hand was probably trustworthy. That's why no one noticed anything before it was too late. Just before the summer started, a new family moved in. Families moving in wasn't terribly uncommon, but this family had a girl my and my friend's age, so it became a big deal. Her name was Ella and her whole family was a bit strange. It took two weeks for them to introduce themselves to anyone. Plenty of people went over to introduce themselves, but even when it was obvious people were home, no one came to the door. Finally word got around that the father was a minister at some church no one in town had heard of and the wife was working part-time at the tailor. We spent a lot of time outside and eventually spotted Ella, my friends, and I, and invited her to join our group in whatever we were up to that afternoon. Through that we learned she had four older brothers and an infant sister. She and her whole family had very antiquated gender roles, prayed before and about virtually anything they did, and would casually mention the end of the world as a non-sequitur. Despite this, they managed to establish themselves as pillars of the community. The father, let's call him Mr. Cyrus, came to every town hall, and his wife Mrs. Cyrus took up a leadership role in the PDA. I think their wholesome Christian image helped defray what would have otherwise been the deeply troubling outbursts of rage Mr. Cyrus would exhibit, sometimes right out in public. He'd hear another adult use a phrase like, God damn it, and fly into a frenzy about how dare you forsake your Lord and Savior, taking his name in vain. His wife would make unsolicited judgmental comments about how other people raised their kids, especially daughters. Despite all that, within a few months, you'd never know they hadn't lived there all their lives. The unspoken understanding in this town was if you left your kids in someone else's care, they had free reign to do whatever they thought best for them and feed them, instruct them, or discipline them, same as if you were their own. The first time I went to Ellis, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The second time Mr. Cyrus led all of us in prayer before we ate our snack, and afterward. I mentioned to my mom how I found it irritating and she basically said, their house, their rules. So I shrugged it off. Neither of us had any way to know Mr. Cyrus was testing the waters. A few weeks later several of our families had gotten together and Mr. Cyrus brought a rifle out of nowhere and asked us girls if we wanted to shoot some cans. He said to the parents, once he'd gotten us excited, I mean, if you're comfortable with guns. Remember, this is rural America. Not one of us girls hadn't already fired a gun in our lives and if any of the parents were uncomfortable about guns, they would never admit so in public. Things progressed little by little every time I went over. Within the next few visits, my friends and I were made to participate in a mini Bible study lesson. I guess one of the other girls had told their parents about the prayer because when we were dropped off, Mr. Cyrus said, Oh, I forgot to mention, Eileen and I had a family Bible study planned for tonight. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can bring the girls back another night. This was the West in the 80s, Christianity was the default and even people who didn't really practice felt obligated to pretend they did. No one in this town would have objected to their kids participating in a Bible study loud enough for anyone to hear. It didn't even matter because the Bible study was sort of fun. None of us complained about it. And we'd all seen how into it Ella seemed and wouldn't have wanted to hurt her feelings by complaining about it. I think Mr. Cyrus took that as one of the final go-heads needed. In late August, Mrs. Cyrus called my and my friend's parents and asked if we wanted to have a sleepover with Ella. Everyone agreed. The first red flag flew up right away. Most of us girls spent half our days off from school doing farm chores and helping around the house, so we were all in jeans. I had never seen Ella in pants, ever, but what we wore had never been any sort of problem. When we got there this time though, Ella had laid out four of her dresses on the bed and told us to change into them, to look more like girls. We all liked playing dress up so changed without complaint but then when we went downstairs Mr. Cyrus said, look how later like you all are now. Doesn't that feel better? You've made God very happy. At this point in a play date we'd usually go out back and make mud pies or play tag or something, but instead Mr. Cyrus jumped right into a Bible lesson. He was basically giving a sermon and talked about heaven and hell and the ways to get into heaven and the ways to get into hell. He scared our seven-year-old minds to death about the fires of hell. Then he did what I can only describe as a cartoony attempt at hypnosis. This was years ago so it's a little fuzzy but he dangled some piece of jewelry, a necklace or something, in front of us and swung it back and forth. While he did that he recited Bible verses about telling the truth and repentance and the end times and clean souls entering the glory of heaven. Then he sat us all down on a couch, 
we were all thoroughly freaked out at this point by the heaven slash hell talk but figured everything else was just a religious ritual of their home because he'd so carefully desensitized us over the past few months. He talked about sin and repentance and asked us if we wanted to go to heaven or hell. I think you can guess what we all said. He said the only way to get to heaven was to be baptized. One of my friends, Shirley, said she'd already been baptized but Mr. Cyrus cut them off, baptized into the real faith. God's faith. He asked if we wanted to know how we could become baptized and we said yes. He said by confessing our sins and making them right with God, committing to living in a Christ-like way, and most importantly, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Sounded easy enough to us. For the next I don't know how long, there were no clocks in this house and it was after dark by then, we did basically an intense Bible study. It could have been anywhere between 10 minutes and 4 hours, when you're little and not accustomed to going to church, any amount of Bible study feels like an eternity. This was interspersed with different prayers for our salvation and making different promises about rejecting sin and resisting temptation. We were all getting very tired and feeling our patience wearing thin for tolerating others' religious beliefs. Then there was a whole bunch of prepper stuff. Different types of guns, talking about growing your own food, the importance of self-reliance. Basically a lecture on survival skills, but with constant emphasis that the greatest survival skill is being a good Christian. He kept us up most of the night after that praying and such. He did some ritual blessing with rubbing oil on our foreheads. He vaguely talked on and off throughout the night about whether we'd want to go with Ella to a wonderful place with lots of other kids who love Christ and said he'd ask our parents about taking us there on a weekend trip. I knew when I was agreeing with him that I had no interest but my mom had taught me the polite thing to do when you get an invitation to something you have no intention of going to is to smile and express interest then closer to the date, say something came up. So I just smiled and expressed interest. He didn't feed us anything the entire time we were there. By the time it started to get light out we were baptized in the backyard. Then we finally fell asleep and a few hours later we were picked up. I told my mom I didn't want to go back there because it was too religious for me. I told her we were up a lot of the night praying. I told my mom there was no food also, but since I'm such a picky eater she was too used to hearing, they had nothing to eat. When I really just meant something like, they served meatloaf and wouldn't even make me a grilled cheese to eat instead. We stopped playing with Ella and just kinda put it behind us until high school, mentioning once every few years, remember that weird religious play date? Since we didn't really understand any of the promises we had made to Mr. Cyrus, we didn't pay half a mind to keeping any of them. We were exhausted and surrounded in daily life by Jesus' rhetoric that everyone took seriously in the moment and then ignored once the preacher was out of earshot. In high school it was heavily rumored that Ella's father Mr. Cyrus had Florence Altef, famed for her involvement with the controversial Branch Davidians, visiting his home and leading some sort of prayer circle for him and people from his church. While I still don't know if she really came to visit him, it was all but irrefutably confirmed in high school that Mr. Cyrus belonged to an offshoot of Shepherd's Rod, Christian apocalyptic extremist group rooted in Seventh-day Adventism. Nobody really talked to them much after that, in town even, because we all considered it a cult. I went out of state after high school and have no idea what happened with Ella's family, but Mr. Cyrus, let's not meet. While this was now almost 16 years ago, I still remember every single detail about this encounter quite vividly. It was so random and so distinctly bizarre that I will never forget just what happened. I'm sorry it's so long. Background, I'm 20 years old at the time and after visiting friends in college for the weekend, found myself traveling home, alone, and taking a late train from Boston out to the suburbs where my car is parked. I'm running late and very concerned that I'm going to miss the last subway out of Boston, but thankfully the train I needed pulled up quickly. I remember being annoyed at myself for creating stress with such an unnecessarily close call as I was definitely on either the very last, or next to last, train out of Boston. And while I have friends I could stay with if I miss the last train, I have to work in the morning, and my phone is completely dead. The ride is long and slow and there is hardly a soul on the train after we leave the immediate Boston area, which isn't odd seeing how it's Sunday and after midnight. Halfway through the 45-minute ride I doze off and jerk awake at hearing the blaring Braintree announcement, which is my stop. In my foggy state I grab my bag and jump off the train, and the moment I realize I'm at the wrong stop, the doors close. Turns out, they were just announcing the train destination, not the train stop. As you can imagine I'm feeling pretty lousy about this watching the train plod off in the direction I needed to be going. I'm the only person to get off the train, and the station is unfamiliar and utterly deserted. Quickly I realize I'm in Quincy 
three long stops away from my destination and I'm feeling screwed. I really really need there to be another train. I look around and realize I'm close to the end of a desolated and strikingly dark outdoor train platform. While the chances for there being another train so late is extremely slim, it's my only hope and I begin to feel panicked, stupid, and vulnerable. After a minute or two of standing there dumbfounded and triple checking that my phone was dead, I suddenly spotted a man, standing alone under a light, a distance down the long and thin platform. A little ways further beyond him, appears to be the only entrance slash exit, unless there are some stairs going down into the terminal halfway down that I can't see. While the man makes me a little nervous, he's clearly facing the tracks, which gives me hope that one last train is on the way, thinking that maybe he just missed the one I got off. I decide to just quietly sit on the bench close by and choose to stay unnoticed and in the dark while I wait. The bench is partially enclosed, and when I sit down on it I'm basically obscured from the shoulders down by deep shadows and can still see in every direction but directly behind me. A quick glance around it though confirms I'm definitely alone down here. So on the dark bench I sit and wait and feel comfortably obscured. With my wearing dark clothes, and it being so dark on my end of the station. I had the opportunity to rather blatantly watch the man at the end of the platform. The well-lit man is tall, thin, not old, like thirties, light slightly shaggy hair, and dressed casually preppy. He's strange though, standing abnormally still, looking straight ahead in a weird way. Something is off, but he's minding his business and probably doesn't even know I'm here. And while I feel really uneasy, I do find some slight comfort in being certain that no one is down here with me and can openly watch the only other person from my dark, hidden, bench. After watching for a few minutes the man begins to rock a little, placing weight on one foot and then another. He then takes a few slow steps towards the edge of the platform and I notice that he's using a white and red walking cane for the visually impaired, and tapping and feeling his way as he walks forward. Suddenly I'm very relieved, as this may explain his unusual posture. Just as I'm feeling more relaxed the feeling vanishes. He's still walking towards the platform edge, and quickly. I stiffen and sit up straight, looking intently. He makes it to the bright yellow, raised metal warning tread that is at the very edge of the platform, only a foot wide, and directly before an eight-foot drop onto electrified train tracks. He stops there, banging his cane against the edge, toes literally at the furthest point. I stand up and walk a few paces closer as he starts to sway again, but more dramatically. My mind begins to race. What's going on? Is this a suicide situation? He is in a lot of danger. I want to take action and try quickly to figure out the best way because this poor man needs help of some kind. I'm just trying to figure out how to approach him because I really don't want to startle him with his being so very close to the edge, in fact, he's the furthest you can go and his swaying has evolved to a kind of dance. Suddenly, after what seems like ages but is probably just a minute or two, he stops and begins to take slow steps backwards until finally he returns to standing still and staring straight ahead, back under that spotlight. With my heart racing and mind spinning, I return to my dark bench, sit back down quietly, and try to process what's suddenly happening. I want to help this man but I am overwhelmed by alarms in my brain. I keep watching and being as silent as possible. He stands calmly for a few minutes under the light, facing the tracks, and safely several paces away from the edge. I decided to get help, I mean, he just did something crazy, really unnerving, and really dangerous and I don't know what his intentions are. I'm still sitting on my dark bench fighting off conflicting feelings and secretly watching him, when he suddenly turns his whole body to directly face me. Straight on facing me, exactly the angle to where I'm sitting, and he's smiling. He's far away, but so well lit, I can tell, he is absolutely smiling and looking suddenly right at me. I'm completely startled, and my jaw drops. My mind is now racing like crazy asterisk, he knows I'm here. He must know I'm here, but if he knows I'm here, why is he facing me? He knows exactly where I'm sitting. What? Is he actually blind? But I'm sitting in the dark and not making a sound. He's smiling asterisk. I freeze solid dash. What happens next is so sudden that I remain basically frozen like a statue, sitting on the dark bench the entire time, not making even the slightest sound. Suddenly, still smiling, he turns and faces the train tracks, and again using his cane, walks right over to the very edge and begins his side-to-side -side swaying except now it's even more dance-like. He then changes position, putting one foot right on the edge, and one foot behind him and starts this exaggerated lunging motion, as one would jump in front of a train, nearly jumping off the platform, but catching himself before he does. He does this repeatedly. All the while, I'm just watching from a distance, basically in, well, horror and confusion. 
Suddenly he stops all this and turns. This time he doesn't face me, but faces in my general direction, my end of the track smiling still from what I can see. He slowly begins to walk down the platform towards me. He is walking right on the edge, directly on the warning track the whole time I can hear the clack of the cane going side to side. He is so close to the edge that the cane is going into the darkness. He gets closer and closer and I can do absolutely nothing but stare. How could he be walking so close to the edge? Why is he coming down here? Closer and closer he gets and I can now see him better. Still the big gaping grin on his face, empty and farcical like a game show host. And his eyes, they're slammed shut. They are gently closed, they are aggressively and exaggeratedly closed very very tight. I know though, that it's possible to peer a little bit while making this face. My mind is exploding and I remain frozen solid. He is now so close, about 20 feet away. I'm thinking that if I hang on just one more minute maybe he'll walk right by me, and with him out of the way of the entrance, I can run and go get help. And maybe, just maybe, his smiling face was just a coincidence. Maybe this whole time he has no idea I'm even here. Maybe he really is blind. But greatly to my dismay, only about 15 feet before he reaches me, he stops and he turns and faces me, eyes still slammed, shut, gaping smile. He is just now standing there on the edge of the platform facing me. His eyes are tightly shut and he is facing right at me. This can't be possible and I feel like I'm in a surreal nightmare and then suddenly, it gets much worse. He starts making this weird, high-pitched whimpering, moaning, feminine, soft laugh. He reaches for the zipper on his pants and unzips them while holding his cane. He pulls down his pants and underwear exposing his penis, and then, while still facing me, starts jumping up and down, all the while continuing to do that soft coil laugh. He then changes position and starts doing that jumping from foot to foot lunging motion like he's about to jump into the path of a train, except now his movement is compromised by his pulled down pants. He continues this, smiling, eyes shut, penis flopping around this way and that, and making that simpering laugh. All the while I'm sitting there is some kind of mesmerized horror state. Suddenly I hear the train rattling loudly and approaching fast. In frozen horror, I'm both groveling in thanks to God and terrified that at the end of all of this true insanity, I'm about to see someone commit suicide right in front of me, or accidentally get hit by the train. Right as the train reached the platform and started slowing down, he returned to simply swaying again and took a step back. Being the very last train of the night, every car seems to have some people on it. I knew immediately I was probably safe. The train stops and I sprint like hell down the platform a few cars distance down and jump off. I don't know if he gets on the train too or just stands there but I definitely don't hear anyone yelling or anything so I assume that he pulled up his pants either way. And so, once on the train, I sink into the seat, my mind thoroughly blown. My mind explodes in every single variation of the feeling that can basically be eloquently summed up as one giant what the F-U-C-K. Gratefully, at the end of all of that, I really do feel immediately safe and I'm not further subjected to worrying about him following me off the train, if he even got on, because there's always other people getting off at Braintree. It was all just quite simply, so odd and bizarre that I felt like, after all these years, sharing it. It's easily the closest thing to a nightmare I've ever experienced. It was so weird, scary, surreal, and happened so quickly that it was almost like I coasted cleanly by being scared and just settled into a kind of hypnosis and unable to move. I'm not trying to be dramatic about it, I just don't know how else to describe it. Honestly, when I got on that train, I was just sitting there a bit tweaked, wide-eyed, and really honestly laughing in my head at the sheer shock of it all. The immense feeling of relief I felt when I boarded the train quickly changed any feelings of horror to that of shock, disbelief, and gratitude.